So enough about weights. Let's talk about what the neuron is actually doing. So the overall strategy here is to think about and understand the electrical properties of the neuron. Uh, it turns out that neurons have electrical charge. They have a, a voltage um, that you can measure. It's a very weak voltage, but it, it really does exist. It's a differential of electrical charge inside and outside the, the neuron. And that is really what creates the potential for information processing, this kind of detection process to take place in the neuron. We can understand how electricity works using very basic principles of physics that are captured in something called Ohm's Law, which you may have heard of. You may have studied that in one of your physics classes. It's one of the most basic equations of, of electricity and magnetism in physics. Um, and that's all you need to really understand how neurons work. Uh, but again, we'll go into the details of the math. You don't need to understand the math, but we'll cover that. But what I really want to present right now is the conceptual level understanding of what the math is doing in a way that everybody can understand that doesn't require kind of working through the symbols. Um, and that conceptual understanding is really what you need. So if you're not very comfortable with math, don't worry about it. Hopefully having this conceptual representation makes it easier to understand what the math is doing. But uh, these pictures will help you understand what's going on. And the key idea really is that there's a constant tug of war taking place inside each neuron. You have a inhibitory side and an excitatory, excitatory side. And uh, I think kids these days still do this. They very much do it in Japan. We were on sabbatical there and our kids took place in a uh, tug of war competition. Um, and so if you're not familiar with this, basically you have people pulling on a rope on either side of the rope and you have some kind of flag in the middle and the side that pulls that flag over to their side is considered to be the winner. And so they're just pulling at this thing and trying to pull that flag one way or the other. And that's really what's happening in a neuron. The inhibitory side is trying to pull the flag, which in this case is the membrane potential, that electrical differential, the difference in uh, positive versus negative charges inside versus outside of the neuron, which we represent by the letter V, which stands for voltage, and M, which stands for membrane, so membrane voltage or membrane potential. That membrane potential is getting pulled up and down based on the strength of inhibitory current or excitatory current. And uh, the current is represented by these um, uh, factors G, which actually mean conductance. And so formally what we're talking about is how open are the channels that allow excitatory ions to enter the neuron versus inhibitory ions to enter the neuron. And that's what we mean by conductance. Conductance is also just the inverse of resistance. And so if you're familiar with the term resistance, a resistor in electrical terms, conductance G is just one over it. And in fact, you know, conductance is way more intuitive than resistance. Resistance is kind of the opposite of what you want to be thinking about as like the negative of something. It's much easier to think about how much, how big are the pipes that are open and allowing ions to flow. That's literally what conductance is. It's just how big are the pipes that let stuff flow in and out of the cell. And so uh, the, the size of the conductance of excitatory ions is represented by the size of this kind of red person pulling the cell up and exciting it. And then the, um, and we think about the red as kind of hot, not negative and not as inhibition. So it's a red, red hot. And then the blue is the cold, throwing cold water on the system and pulling that down and dragging the membrane potential down. So the additional terminology that we have here is these points um, where the individuals are standing and pulling from. And this is a critical concept that, that has a lot of important implications for how neurons actually behave. These E guys are called the driving potential or they're also called the reversal potential. You may have heard of those terms before. And there's a, a particular reversal potential or driving potential for inhibition and a different one for excitation. In biological cells, typically it's about minus 0.75, millib minus 75, not point, minus 75 millivolts <clears throat> for the negative reversal potential. 
and then uh, for the inhibitory reversal potential, and then zero or 50 or you know some higher number for the positive uh, reversal potential. It's a little bit murky sometimes what that number is. Um, in any case, that's the kind of defining the playing field on which the, the two are playing. And the really important thing is that as the membrane potential gets closer to one side of the playing field or the other, the leverage, the strength that somebody has to pull further gets smaller and smaller. And in fact, the, the leverage is directly proportional to the difference between the current membrane potential and that uh, driving potential for that side of the, of the, of the field, essentially. And so um, if in inhibition is very strong and pulling the membrane potential down closer to the inhibitory reversal potential, then um, in fact it, it ends up pulling less and there ends up being less and less current such that in fact when the membrane potential is at the reversal potential, effectively the inhibition is exerting no force at all. And what that means is that even a little bit of excitation can start to pull the flag off of that baseline, yank it up towards more towards the center, but that as soon as the excitation starts doing that, then all of a sudden this latent kind of uh, force that's been sitting there but hasn't been able to be exerted gets exerted and you pull, that inhibition pulls back very strongly. And this is called shunting inhibition and you may have heard of that term. Um, and that's really where it comes from is the fact that the amount of force that, that, that each side exerts is proportional to the difference between the current memory potential and the driving potential. And so when you're close to your reversal potential, your driving potential, you don't exert much force, but you have it there kind of in reserve. It's latent, it's shunting. Another really important principle that is present in these systems is that the membrane potential does not reflect the absolute quantity of uh, current on either side, but really the relative amounts. And this is really important. The relative balance determines where that membrane potential is going to go. So for example, if you have you know, equally balanced uh, excitatory and inhibitory drive on the uh, conductance on the cell, then uh, the flag, the membrane potential will be in the middle and that, that will be the same even if these guys are half the size, right? So um, it doesn't matter what the absolute strength is, it's relative. So this is a kind of special relativity of neurons. The absolute quantity doesn't matter. What matters is the relative balance. This turns out to be really important for understanding how neurons can adapt over a very wide range of inputs. So for example, when you walk outside on a sunny day, you're getting millions of times more kind of uh, uh, light energy hitting your, your brain compared to like right now in my dark room here where I'm giving this lecture, it's very, very dim. And so uh, that difference is, is massive, but the neurons are able to compensate and deal with those differences because they're encoding the signal in relative terms, not in absolute terms. And uh, another example of this is that we don't have perfect pitch, most of us. Most of us can't tell what actual kind of pitch sound you're hearing. This is because your neurons are factoring away all that absolute information. They're just throwing it away and only encoding kind of relative signals. And so, in fact, this kind of puzzling thing, like you can buy a $4 gadget that tells you the pitch. It's really easy to do. It's, it's like the most basic signal. But our brains are actually more sophisticated by throwing away that uh, absolute information and only focusing on relative differences. And this has implications throughout all of cognition. So uh, people uh, judge other people relative to expectations. And you might think of important current examples of that where if somebody sets a low expectation then people sort of basically say okay well that's what we expect. Uh, I'm not going to get upset about that because they have that's what I already expect. And now um, that may be a tool that you could use to your advantage, understanding that brains fundamentally work on relative signals. And so uh, expectation management, expectation setting is critical for uh, basically how, how the brain works. So here's another example in the top here where you have uh, a large amount of inhibition and a relatively small amount of excitation, um, and that shifts the balance uh, towards the inhibition.
And we can see mathematically that this kind of place where the membrane potential ends up, what we call the equilibrium membrane potential, um, reflects literally just the ratio, the relative ratio between excitation and inhibition. We'll see that in a moment. So in the resting state of the neuron, typically you have, in fact, a lot of effective inhibition taking place. The membrane potential is close to the reversal potential. Um, and then when excitation comes in, uh, as it builds, it kind of encounters this resistance that's been sitting there but hasn't really been kind of expressed because, again, the membrane potential is really close to that driving reversal potential and it doesn't um, do anything. 